Ring of Honor Wrestling has been a part of the professional wrestling landscape for close to 20 years. However, recent events have indicated that Ring of Honor, at least Ring of Honor as we know and love it, may not be long for the wrestling world, with news that the promotion is to go on hiatus shocking the industry. But perhaps it shouldn't come as too much of a shock, as Ring of Honor, revolutionary and as influential as they were, always fought an uphill battle when it came to survival. Inside the ring, Ring of Honor were at times unparalleled and led the way when it came to state-of-the-art pro wrestling. They launched the careers of many future legends and were a distinct and genuine alternative for fans who craved something else. Economically, however, the realities of running a promotion of that size and scope were stark. But Ring of Honor did it, and did it well for two decades, despite the threat of closure often hanging over them. How did they manage to survive and thrive for so long? Why did they eventually find themselves in their current predicament, and what is their legacy in the business? I'm Ross Tweddle from Cultaholic Wrestling, and this is the rise and fall of Ring of Honor. Join us! The era of honor begins. Ring of Honor was the brainchild of Rob Feinstein, a longtime Philadelphia wrestling fan who became a known tape trader in the 90s as the owner of RF Video. Feinstein not only distributed tapes from places like Japan and Mexico and some small US indies, but also worked directly with ECW, filming and releasing fan cam videos of the company's house shows. RF Video were also noted for being one of the originators of the shoot interview and must have made an absolute packet, bear coin, lots of money, flogging VHS videotapes to wrestling fans back in the day. But come mid-2001, ECW was out of business, as too was WCW. Wrestling's popularity declined somewhat, and naturally, that affected Feinstein's once booming business. Good job he had all of that wonga, that, that, that change, that, that top dollar, before it grew up to become a part of Hit Row. Feinstein needed to diversify, and after watching all pro wrestling's King of the Indies tournament, Feinstein teamed up with Gabe Sapolsky and Doug Gentry to launch their own promotion. Using some of the tournament standouts, including Christopher Daniels, Brian Spanky Kendrick, the American Dragon Brian Danielson, Samoa Joe, Low Key, and Doug Williams as its backbone. The shows were budgeted to break even if the attendances hovered around 500 people and would take place in Northeast markets, at least to start with. Though the shows themselves would not likely be big money spinners, not at least initially, RF Video could sell merchandise to those in attendance and then, later on, sell tapes of their own shows online or through mail order. Headlined by a blistering triple threat between Daniels, Key and Danielson and also featuring an array of up and coming indie talent as well as a rare meeting between Eddie Guerrero and Super Crazy, Ring of Honor's first show, The Era of Honor Begins, took place on February the 23rd, 2002 at Philadelphia's Murphy Rex Center. Golden Years for the next couple of years, Ring of Honor stuck to their business plan of putting on great shows full of young and hungry talent in front of modest crowds. In many ways, the last of the territories in a post-Monday Night War era, Ring of Honor was a breeding ground for performers who wanted to make or otherwise solidify their reputations. As a result, they quickly gained a reputation among wrestling fans thanks to their markedly different style and ability to discover and nurture the next generation of wrestlers. While they often brought in the stars of the past to draw in the nostalgic, they also gave opportunities to the likes of CM Punk, Colt Cabana, The Amazing Red, The Briscoe Brothers, Paul London and others. And the word of mouth it spread like wildfire. While Feinstein ran operations, the actual booking was handed by Sapolsky, a disciple of Paul Heyman who tried to give the promotion a solid identity with its own clear presentation and implemented unique aspects like the Code of Honor. Rules the wrestlers would need to follow, such as shaking hands before matches and respecting the officials. All of these individual pieces gave things a decidedly more sports-like feel. You see, far from simply trying to fill the void left by ECW like so many indies of the day did, Ring of Honor offered a product that was far more technically minded and heavily inspired by Japan. It was perfect 
professional wrestling with the emphasis firmly on the wrestling. In 2003, Ring of Honor welcomed the stars of All Japan Pro Wrestling and also helped to bolster its international profile by co-promoting a show with England's Frontier Wrestling Alliance. While world champion Samoa Joe made the promotion must-see by routinely putting on banger after banger with whomever he stepped in the ring with. Things were going well and Ring of Honor's reputation was growing exponentially until early 2004 when a scandal threatened to bring the company down. Ring of Honor owner Rob Feinstein was implicated in an online sting operation, which was broadcast on local Philadelphia news. According to the report, Feinstein showed up to a house to meet somebody who he thought was a 14-year-old boy, when he was confronted by a camera crew and fled the scene. Feinstein has long maintained his innocence and was never charged with anything in relation to the incident. But it had major implications for Ring of Honor, who issued a statement saying that Feinstein, who held a 51% stake in the company, was gone, while Ring of Honor also hired a PR firm to manage the fallout. Whether Feinstein was gone immediately or not is up for debate. From this point forward, the shots were called by Sapolsky, Doug Gentry and Carrie Silken, a New York City ticket broker who held a partial stake, and from this point fourth was the new owner of Ring of Honor. Under Silken, Ring of Honor had what was probably their best ever period, from an in-ring perspective at least, though they did become self-sufficient for a time in late 2005. While relations with TNA, who shared talent with Ring of Honor, became strained in the aftermath of the scandal, meaning TNA stars like Christopher Daniels and AJ Styles could no longer be booked, Ring of Honor actually grew and expanded their operations, touring in new markets and beefing up their schedule, while also diversifying with their own shoot interviews and other products. They also started putting on some amazing shows, featuring some of the best wrestling that could be seen anywhere in the world, with a bevy of matches that could hold up as some of the best of the era. Passionate pro wrestling fans were enamoured, and thanks to glowing reviews from the likes of Dave Meltzer, even some more casual fans were starting to seek out Ring of Honor. The Joes, Danielsons and Punks were helped significantly by the emergence of Nigel McGuinness, Austin Aries, Homicide and a steady stream of up-and-comers who were happy to take their place at the top whenever WWE or TNA inevitably signed away Ring of Honor's biggest hitters. Ring of Honor also greatly strengthened their international fan base by forming relationships with companies around the world. Most notably with Pro Wrestling Noah in Japan, themselves a rising upstart promotion threatening to upset the apple cart. Through their relationship with Noah, we got the likes of Kenta, Takeshi Morishima, and the legendary Kenta Kobashi plying their trade in a Ring of Honor ring, while other companies like the revolutionary Dragon Gate also got involved. This was great for hardcore fans being able to see the greatest international stars on their doorstep. But Ring of Honor talents got a tour overseas too, enhancing their appeal and skill set, and letting audiences far and wide know that Ring of Honor meant business. It wasn't just internationally where Ring of Honor were cutting deals and forming partnerships, as a working agreement with ultra-violent hardcore promotion CZW led to an inter-promotional war between the two products. This war proved that although great wrestling was always the main draw, Ring of Honor could also tell a great story. Same too with angles such as Raven vs Punk. Things were looking good for Ring of Honor. They were branching out and maintaining their buzz. They were the number three promotion in the United States and a place where every budding grappler wanted to work. They were the darlings of the diehard fans and seen as the last bastion for professional wrestling in a scene that had become far more concerned with entertainment. On the contrary, in fact, they were often losing money as overheads and other expenses increased. Mismanagement, infighting and NXT. Creatively, the direction of Ring of Honor changed when Sapolsky was let go as head booker, being replaced by Adam Pearce, who in turn would be replaced by Hunter Delirious Johnson. The company struck a deal to air a weekly television program on HD Net Fights, signing a two-year contract in January 2009 and hiring Jim Cornette to act as executive producer, which gave them further exposure. Cornette would act as more than just executive producer, however. Though never officially named as head booker, the product soon had a sticky, sprite covered fingerprints all over it. Though the tennis racket connoisseur implemented some well-received changes, his time with the pencil was also quite controversial. He clashed with top Ring of Honor stars like Kevin Steen, some criticised him for dropping the ball when talents were hot, and for his bookings being stuck in the past, and well being a bit... A bit boring. 
Cornette stuff had worked well in regional settings like Smoky Mountain Wrestling and OVW, but he was very much a man out of time and place, and it wasn't a shock to see Johnson regain control of the creative direction. However, Johnson's tenure as head booker was also divisive, and slowly but surely, fan support started to trickle away. A chunk of the Cornette era came at a pivotal time for the company, as it was sold from Carrie Silkin to the Sinclair Broadcast Company, announced on May the 21st, 2011. James E. and former WCW promoter Gary Juster helped broker the deal, which was worked out with Joe Coff with the idea that the Sinclair Group would put Ring of Honor programming on their stations in their home markets on the weekends, and that Ring of Honor would tour those markets off the back of that. They believed that if Ring of Honor had a stronger local TV presence, they could attract an average of 750 fans to shows, and in theory, have a decent, profitable business. That might have worked in a bygone age, but it wasn't going to happen in the early 2010s, when wrestling in general wasn't exactly at its most popular. Alas, Ring Ring of Honor did not average 750 fans. Still, the group soldiered on, relying on a new generation of stars such as the Young Bucks, Red Dragon, Cody, Jay Lethal, Adam Cole, among others. Production values increased and the arenas got bigger and more and more fans caught on to the BTE lads. But it was Ring of Honor's partnership with an insurgent New Japan Pro Wrestling that really helped push things to the next level. And they were soon able to offer decent, full-time contracts to performers as their business grew. Come 2018, Ring of Honor were arguably the second biggest wrestling group in America, thanks in a large part to their work with the Red Hot New Japan and super popular Bullet Club. But while Ring of Honor had always had to contend with their top stars being poached, this became a more frequent issue when Paul Triple H Levesque decided to sign the glut of their best wrestlers to NXT, which, let's face the facts, was just WWE's own version of Ring of Honor. Kevin Steen, Adam Cole, Red Dragon, even El Generico's mate, Sami Zayn, all followed in the footsteps of Brian Danielson, Tyler Black, Chris Hero, and the like. But Triple H was unsuccessful in securing a couple of Ring of Honor's more elite, get it? Workers. All in. The cerebral assassin didn't manage to secure the signatures of Bullet Club troublemakers Nick and Matt Jackson, who were vital to both Ring of Honor and New Japan, but who were, along with Cody, dismayed at Ring of Honor's reluctance to run bigger venues on a more regular basis. They knew wrestling was experiencing a major upswing, and so they, in conjunction with Ring of Honor, used their own money to fund and promote All In, an independent pay-per-view that attracted over 11,000 fans in Chicago and around 50,000 thousand pay-per-view buys, all based off a silly bet with Davey Ravey Ravey Davey Ravey Davey Meltzer. He loves a rave, he loves a bet, he lost this bet, and that's good. Widely hailed as a pivotal moment in modern professional wrestling and, on the surface, a good thing for Ring of Honor, the overwhelming success of All In would prove to be the beginning of the end for the Sinclair-owned outfit. Bullet Club's Cody, The Bucks, Kenny Omega, and many other important players left Ring of Honor and New Japan in late 20. 2018 to help front all elite wrestling. A new venture backed by the billionaire Khan family, and seeing as Ring of Honor had put all of their weight behind pushing Bullet Club and the elite, they were left with egg on their face and a devastated main event scene. As we have seen over the last few years, AEW has gone from strength to strength, firmly establishing themselves as one of the top wrestling organizations in the world, while, in truth, Ring of Honor got left behind. Yes, Ring of Honor did manage to sell out Madison Square Garden for a G1 Supercard show, co-promoted with New Japan, their biggest and most attended event in history, but most contend that the New Japan portion was the draw, as well as the initial advertisement of Kenny Omega and the Bucks, who obviously obviously didn't end up making that particular booking. In fact, it is widely agreed that the New Japan Pro Wrestling portions of the show were great. The New Japan Pro Wrestling Ring of Honor crossover stuff was decent, and the Ring of Honor matches were just alright at best. Still, it must be said that the MSG show was a strong bit of business. But that good news would be one of the few real positives for a year that is pinpointed as the true start of Ring of Honor's decline. In fact, one of the first big hits came on that G1 Supercard show, as Matt Taven beat Marty Skull and Jay Lethal in a ladder match to become Ring of Honor champion. Most fans expected Skrill, their most popular star and sole elite member left in the company, to become champ or, at the very least, for the also popular and long-reigning champion Lethal to retain. But as ever, Ring of Honor dropped the ball with their booking. The decision to make Taven the champ was not well received. 
at all. Neither was the booking and continued involvement of Bully Ray. Nor, for that matter, was Ring of Honor's TV output being months behind the pay-per-views in storyline terms. Inexcusable for a promotion owned by a TV company. And let's not talk about the whole Enzo and Cass debacle, shall we? Come the end of 2019, the aging PCO, a long-time mid-card act and joined something of an Indian summer in Ring of Honor, was made world champion just 77 days after the well-liked Roosh had dethroned Taven. Again, this move was widely derided, as were certain backstage scandals, like women's champion Kelly Klein being fired for speaking up about the company's alleged lack of care when it came to concussion protocol. Ring of Honor was clearly struggling on many fronts, and the disinterest in the product led to a fall in attendance and a frame of relations with New Japan. And then bloody COVID hit. A whimpering end? Like all wrestling and live entertainment companies, the COVID-19 pandemic devastated Ring of Honor. To their credit, they didn't let anyone go and gave talent and staff security during uncertain times. But the lack of fans hurt their bottom line considerably. Unlike WWE or AEW, Ring of Honor don't have large television rights fees contracts. They just had a reasonable budget from Sinclair. Still, in spite of that, they were able to pay and keep people on while they shut down and proceeded with caution as the pandemic raged on. The live crowds wouldn't return until the Best in the World pay-per-view on July the 11th, 2021. The first show with fans since Gateway to Honor on February the 29th, 2020. Best in the World was enjoyed by critics and fans and was certainly a noteworthy event as several major title changes went down. But despite that, there was very little buzz around Ring of Honor. In truth, there hadn't been much buzz around Ring of Honor for quite some while. AEW had quite clearly taken much of Ring of Honor's audience away, as well as several of their stars and their reputation for putting on great matches. It was also noticeable how AEW kicked open the proverbial forbidden door and worked with seemingly every promotion bar Ring of Honor. Quite simply, AEW was the new darling of the hardcores, while Ring of Honor's best days were long behind them. I mean, AEW got former Ring of Honor champion CM Punk to come out of his self-imposed pro wrestling exile. How could Ring of Honor even hope to compete with that? It wasn't just AEW, the likes of MLW, NXT, PWG, and of course New Japan Pro Wrestling. They were all doing the Ring of Honor style, but better than Ring of Honor were. They had lost their niche, they'd lost their most popular stars, Ring of Honor had become, and dare I say this, almost irrelevant, unthinkable at one stage. Then, on October the 27th, 2021, Ring of Honor issued a statement announcing that would be going on a hiatus following December's final battle and would aim to return in April 2022. When, or indeed if, they do return, it will not be the Ring of Honor we knew and loved. As part of their statement, Ring of Honor mentioned that all personnel would be released from their contracts and that everyone was free to work anywhere else. Contract or not, effective immediately. This came just days before Sinclair Broadcast Company released their 2021 Q3 earnings report, which revealed the company was in millions of dollars of debt. And just how much is Ring of Honor worth to a broadcast giant like Sinclair? You know, really? Evidently, not that much. According to the statement, Ring of Honor will return with a new mission and strategy, promising a new, fan-focused product. So, the question remains, is this the end for Ring of Honor? At this stage, it's really hard to say, but the outlook, it doesn't seem too great now, does it? Whatever shape the company takes after their hiatus will surely be very different to what it has been before. Not that change is anything new for Ring of Honor. They have, against all odds, been in business for 20 years now. They have experienced many dizzying highs and lamentable lows. 20 years for a Northeast indie willed into existence as a vehicle for shilling wrestling merchandise, that's pretty incredible, you know? Their legacy will always be the greatest Great matches that took place in their black and red rings over the course of two decades that saw them introduce the wrestling world to performers that would go on to become some of the biggest stars in the industry. Without Ring of Honor, it's hard to predict what would have become of CM Punk, Brian Danielson, or Samoa Joe, or Kevin Owens, Seth Rollins, Adam Cole, Kyle O'Reilly, Roderick Strong, the list is literally endless. Ring of Honor really did change the business, helping to popularize a style that was far from in vogue when they were at the forefront and that was, in many ways, looked down on by those in WWE and elsewhere. If they are to return, let's hope that, for the industry's sake, that they can contribute and find their place in today's wrestling world. I mean, who knows? Let's not be dismissive, everybody. Perhaps a new era of honor is just about to begin.